Alors, bienvenue à la saison 2021 de l'Orchestre de la francophonie. C'est la 20e saison euh, de l'Orchestre et euh, je vous souhaite la bienvenue à la série Invités de marque. Notre invité aujourd'hui est Dr. John Chong. Nous sommes ravis que Dr. John Chong soit avec nous aujourd'hui. Alors, merci à vous. Euh, Dr. John Chong est le directeur médical de la Musi Musicians Clinic of Canada et a été impliqué auprès de la Performing Arts Medicine Association en tant que président et trésorier. Il est spécialiste en santé publique et en médecine préventive et a un intérêt particulier pour la santé complémentaire et intégrative. Il a traité des musiciens souffrant de micro-traumatismes répétés, de problèmes de contrôle moteur, d'anxiété, de dépression, de douleurs neuropathiques, de syndrome de compression des nerfs et de stress. Aujourd'hui, le titre de sa présentation est « Madness ». Alors, MANES, c'est M pour fatigue musculaire, A pour anxiété, D pour dépression, NE pour compression des nerfs, et SS pour syndrome de stress. So, welcome to the 2021 season of l'Orchestre de la Francophonie. It's our 20th season, and welcome to the series Special Guest Presentations. Our guest today is Dr. John Chong. We are delighted to have Dr. Chong with us today, thanks to you. Uh, Dr. Don John Chong is the Medical Director of the Musicians Clinic of Canada and has been involved with the Performing Arts Medicine Association as President and Current Treasurer. He is a specialist in public health and preventive medicine and has a special interest in complementary and integrative health. He has treated musicians with repetitive strain injuries, motor control problems, anxiety, depression, neuropathic pain, nerve entrapments, and stress-related disorders since 1986. Today, the title of his presentation is Madness. So M for, music, for muscle fatigue, A for anxiety, D for depression, and E for nerve entrapment, and SS for stress syndrome spells. So, alors, avant de débuter la présentation, l'Orchestre de la Francophonie voudrait remercier ses partenaires financiers et reconnaît l'appui du gouvernement du Canada et d'Emploi Québec, Ile de Montréal. L'OF remercie ses commanditaires Canimex et Panorama Media. L'OF remercie les fondations suivantes, RBC Foundation, Fondation CBAS, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada et la Zeller Family Foundation. Before we start the presentation, uh, l'Orchestre de la Francophonie would like to thank their financial partners and the uh, OF acknowledges the Government of Canada's support and Emploi Québec, Ile de Montréal. The OF would like to thank their private sponsors, Canimex and Panorama Media. The OF would like to thank the following foundations, RBC Foundation, Fondation CBAS, Le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada, and the Zeller Family Foundation. Alors, vous pouvez trouver la programmation complète euh, de l'OF cette saison est disponible sur la page d'accueil du site web de l'OF. Et vous pouvez aussi nous suivre à Facebook euh, de l'OF et cliquez sur l'onglet plus événements, donc vous aurez toute la programmation complète. You can follow us on and have the access to the full program schedule on Facebook. You tab on plus and événements. You can follow us also on, on the, the YouTube uh, of OF and on Instagram at, uh, at OF slash 2021 and on Instagram also and Twitter. Alors, euh, tous les élèves pourront poser des questions à la fin de la présentation. N'oubliez pas de, aussi que le public aussi qui assiste euh, à la présentation peut aussi poser des questions. Alors, dans Zoom, vous allez dans Q&A, vous inscrivez vos questions et euh, Dr. Chan va se faire un plaisir de vous répondre. So, all students can ask questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the public is also invited to ask questions. Uh, you need to go on the, the Zoom on Q&A 
and write down your questions and Dr. Chang will be, will have pleasure to answer your questions. Alors, merci et bonne présentation. Thank you and enjoy the presentation. Great, thank you, Sylvie. Um, it's a great honor to uh, speak to you today, wherever you are around the world and live on YouTube. So I'll start by sharing my screen and picking this file and we'll zoom up from the beginning. Good. Hopefully uh, everything's okay there. You can see it. Uh, I can't see me, but <clears throat> we'll start. Um, as in the introduction, Sylvie mentioned the title of the talk is actually Madness which is an acronym for what you heard. And I'll go through uh, this in roughly four movements. It's, it's gonna feel a bit long like a Bruckner symphony, but uh, feel free to kind of chime in or take a breath or move around. Uh, that's the beauty of doing Zoom webinars. We're not <clears throat> stuck in a concert hall or a lecture hall. So um, make sure you can uh, uh, pause when you feel there's too much or if there's anything triggering, just let me know. Uh, so overall, my concept is tuning the mind and body of the musician for optimal health and performance. So um, these are the concepts. This is a, <clears throat> a nice little graphic from my early days at the Royal Conservatory. A colleague Bob Dagno uh, did this, this uh, little uh, metaphor up, uh, which is serves my career moving forward. What I've done is uh, started out as a pianist and composer, gone through electrical engineering and medical school, and then uh, all this postgraduate training and then started the clinic way back when. I'll give you a bit of history and then uh, move forward with some of the science and how we approach these problems. And most importantly, what you can do to prevent uh, these injuries and illnesses. I also <clears throat> am affiliated with McMaster University and University of Toronto, as well as <clears throat> had taught the uh, performance awareness class at the Glenn Gould School. Uh, as you as mentioned, I have some uh, administrative duties with the Performing Arts Medicine Association and keeping the clinic going during these tough COVID times. Performing Arts Medicine Association started in the early 80s by Dr. Alice Bronfenbrenner. Its mission is to prove the <clears throat> well-being of performing artists. <clears throat> We've grown from a small group of physicians meeting in Aspen every year to a multidisciplinary and international group. Uh, you can see that the different disciplines represented and more are growing. And we do have a journal uh, that we're associated with, The Medical Problems of Performing Artists. Our website is artsmed.org. So you can see the nice uh, emblem. We've retooled our website and uh, welcome you to uh, enjoy uh, and explore some of the <clears throat> information about this fascinating field. My, my uh, shtick or focus, uh, as I mentioned, is the awareness of performance stress. Uh, unfortunately, you guys are not together performing in Montreal. I've heard in previous years, you've had great, great sessions with uh, Jean-Philippe, um, but uh, virtually the same issues can apply. Uh, <clears throat> my history with um, Injury goes back to my own, own childhood in Oakville, Ontario, and was at the conservatory on scholarship, except my right hand gave out when I was 14. I was uh, hitting the big time, dreaming of a famous career, going to Juilliard or bust like everybody else, um, but I injured myself after a performance at Massey Hall from uh, over-practicing the Wanderer fantasy. So I learned my lesson to not only focus on uh, my collection of Steinways, but also on my own health. And it still applies uh, today. So I'd like to share that with you during our brief time together. We all uh, have fantasies, as I mentioned, from uh, your studio, your practice room, to making it big on some stage. And uh, we all have had that experience um, in our music education. And we also have our heroes uh, in the back of our minds, whether it be Vladimir Horowitz, 
or, or whoever you have. And it you know, hopefully does change from time to time, but there are the greats and we strive for perfection. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, the industry itself is not that clear cut. Uh, we, uh, no matter how great you are and tough you are, uh, uh, the industry itself has financial uh, barriers. So financial stress is the no one of the number one determinants of your current health. And here's some data from uh, our Canadian uh, census back uh, about 10 years ago. Not a pretty picture uh, in the arts. Now, if you think about sports, which is very much related, you can add on maybe three or four zeros on onto that. Uh, for sure, uh, uh, three zeros if you're thinking about your beloved uh, Montreal Canadiens or Habs. Uh, other, other areas uh, of sports are even higher and some, of course, at the Olympics are uh, suffering uh, under current circumstances. So uh, madness, there's the acronym. I uh, actually typed that in 1986 when we started the clinic at the request of the Organization of Canadian Symphony Musicians, which is your Canadian union, which is still very active. Um, also at that time, the Canada Health Act uh, came into being guaranteeing universality, accessibility and portability across our great nation of Canada. Um, there are still a little uh, glitches in, uh, for Quebec Quebecers to access right across the country, but we're still working on it. So the clinic started in 86 and is still going, uh, treating basically uh, what we started out with in 1986. So it's been a long ride, so to speak. Uh, funding for both the arts and healthcare is a challenge, uh, especially as governments change from time to time. So being uh, in this field since the 80s, uh, we've seen governments um, provincially as well as federally change um, this way and that way uh, up and down. So funding is always uh, an issue as it is of course for uh, Orchestra Francophonie and National Youth Orchestra and many of our um, conservatoires uh, across the country. So bottom line, here's the definition of what a performing performance related musculoskeletal disorder is all about. This was the original definition back in the late 80s, put together by Christine Zaza, uh, which comes directly from the reports of injured musicians uh, out of Oxum. So pain uh, during and after playing, numbness and tingling, weakness and loss of control. So obviously pain is more common than numbness and tingling than it is weakness. But again, loss of control is part of the whole uh, constellation of uh, PRMD or performance related musculoskeletal disorder. Also, uh, the definition I like uh, for repetitive strain injury or overuse injury is the following. It's pain and loss of function in all of those structures used in uh, the function, in this case, performing a musical instrument or the voice due to use which is excessive for the individual affected. Key phrase, due to use, which is excessive for the individual affected. Okay, so that takes out a lot of the group comparisons. Um, so when a person comes injured and referred to the clinic, we have to examine the use pattern, both physical and psychological use uh, for that particular individual uh, involved in a specific set of uh, tasks, whether it be artistic or athletic or uh, making income in a normal job, okay? Now, what do we know in the, in the evidence? Okay, so the field has moved on quite a ways over 30 years. <clears throat> and here's the benchmark study put together by an Australian group led by Bronwyn Ackerman, who is a research physiotherapist at Sydney uh, as well as her team, Diana Kenny and Tim Driscoll. So what they did was get together with uh, uh, government funding, Australian government funding, a group of 400 orchestral musicians, professional across eight orchestras in Australia. They got uh, everybody's participation and uh, followed them forward. The original studies 
released was this data. The headlines are as follows, 84% lifetime prevalence of injury. At any time you have a chance 50-50 of playing hurt. Okay, so that's headlines and it's not a pretty picture. So uh, that rivals uh, football or, or soccer, uh, you know, some high contact sports, even hockey. Now, what are the risk factors they identified in this group of 400 symphony musicians? Uh, uh, muscle tension, long practice sessions, insufficient rest, poor posture, muscle fatigue, sudden increase in playing, repertoire scheduling, stress, lack of fitness, and insufficient warm-up. Okay, you notice that there's no, nothing to do with genetics there, nothing to do with politics, um, nothing to do with the weather. Okay, so these are all factors that are uh, in, embedded in what we do as musicians, and therefore the injury uh, uh, awareness uh, and also uh, diagnosis and treatment follows from these set of risk factors. Now let's look at um, the bottom line, life and death here. So this is a study by Diana Kenny of the same uh, uh, research group in Sydney, looking at a different sector of the performing arts industry, which happens to be uh, non-classical musicians. Okay, so across the bottom, you see the genre of popular music from the blues to hip hop and the average age of death. And in the uh, heavier lines for male and female, you see across the different genres, uh, the um, rather grim uh, statistics, whether you can see on the right side, rap and hip hop, you're lucky to make it to 30 years old or the so-called 27 club. Uh, but if you're in classical music, most of the time, uh, you're not included in the study. And uh, if you're a blues player in New Orleans, you probably um, uh, make it to a good old age. So there's some interesting variables at play uh, from this study. It's too bad we don't have the data across classical music genres, but anybody wanted to do a PhD, uh, great. Now, how to do this is that you get a graduate student and go through all the magazines between 1950 and 2014 and identify a dead rock star. Okay, first of all, they have to be dead and they have to be famous to be written up in, a, in Rolling Stone, basically. And that's what you get. And that's a huge number of musicians that have passed in that time frame. <clears throat> what did they die of? Good question. Interesting. They did not die of repetitive strain injury, but they did have uh, accidents, did they have suicides, homicides? Uh, you'll see there where the excessive red is uh, as well as by uh, genre of uh, their popular music. Uh, those who uh, make it to an old age, unfortunately have chronic diseases, heart related issues and cancer. And um, you can see why it's green, why they survived. That's because there's not enough uh, musicians making it to an old age in rap and hip hop. They have a very short and dramatic death, unfortunately. So what do we know in a, uh, about uh, physical and mental health? Well, we know a lot more about physical health in classical music, uh, but what do we know about mental health and stress? So here's a study from the British Musicians Union uh, published um, not too long ago, and they're continuing to follow up their study. Headlines again, musicians may be up to three times more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression compared to the public. And in the small print, uh, it's about anxiety and depression. And the reasons, the qualitative reasons are below. This is a good uh, sample size of over 2000 professional musicians in the UK. They cite poor working conditions, lack of recognition for the work, physical impacts, injuries, as well as problems of uh, harassment, uh, both sexual, physical, and, and psychological issues, which of course now have become much more uh, public uh, in the last few years. 
Here's a big study from Melbourne, Australia. Notice the, much of the research comes from government funding in Australia. Uh, and uh, this is a very big study of the whole performing arts in industry, about 3,000 uh, persons in this uh, sample. Uh, th the nice thing about this study it includes not only the performers, uh, which we're interested in, but also those who work in the industry, the support workers, as well as the technical workers. So you get a nice cross-sectional view of what's actually happening uh, in the business. So the culture, headlines. Uh, the industry workers ex express overwhelming passion for their creative work. So that's why you're here listening in today on this uh, webinar, uh, because we love the work and we don't want to get hurt. The problem is they identified a negative, powerful negative culture within the industry, including a toxic, bruising work environment, extreme competition, bullying, sexual assault, sexism, and racism. And there are high levels of mental health problems and suicidality. Uh, sleep patterns are a mess. So uh, it's very important to, to look at your own uh, stress and sleep patterns and uh, get help for regulating that. Uh, here are the headlines for the mental health issues. Um, 44% of the workers had moderate to severe anxiety, 10 times that of the Australian general population. And the levels of depressive symptoms are five times higher than the general Australian population scores. And about 60% of the workers in the study uh, have sought help for their mental health issues. Suicidality is a very, very important issue, not only clinically, but also uh, in your uh, uh, group. And, and here are some of the uh, rather uh, startling data here. So uh, attempts are double that of the general population. Thinking about it is nine times more than the population. Okay, and experience and planning is for real. So if you know of somebody in trouble, um, please uh, get them to help uh, as soon as possible. Uh, drug and alcohol use. Uh, again, a bit uh, startling data. Uh, this is Australian, so we don't have Canadian data. So uh, the only thing I can say, maybe Australians are more honest than Canadians. I'm not sure about that, but look at the rates uh, uh, of double, you know, 11 to 19 standard drinks in one day. That's a lot, even um, during the Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, uh, stimulants, eight times greater. Uh, very, uh, cocaine, whoa, 12 times. Um, THC, four times greater. Interestingly, much higher is painkillers, basically opioids, which um, have uh, taken the lives of many, many performing artists. And of course, tranquilizers. You have stress and that's what you usually get from your family doctors, even still today. Uh, interesting of this study findings, you know, they were willing to say, I'm addicted to these substances. But the problem is, is identifying it and getting help, a big issue. So that's what we know uh, up, up to this time. Um, I'll start with a uh, straightforward biomechanics, which is where I started back in the 80s. It's, so, it's a field called ergonomics. So it's how your body, the human body relates to a, a task. So in this case, playing a musical instrument or producing sound. Um, and it involves many factors, posture, tension, force, etc. down the list here. So you can see a simple example is the clarinet. Um, and you can see the weight of the clarinet is resting on the extensors of the thumb. And if you uh, play for any great length of time, normally four to six hours a day, you are gonna have a chronic static loading of the extensors of the right thumb, often resulting in flex in a decur veins tenosynovitis. Okay, obviously wiggling your fingers and operating those funny keys with your pinky, those wind wooden players um, 
it's going to create strain across the um, uh, hand, wrist, and forearm muscles. So this is a breakdown. This is what's in your hand, wrist, and forearm. And because of the strain and the weight of the instrument, you can see the muscles, uh, which are in red, and the yellow structures, which are nerves, uh, get strained. The problem is, is in the structure of the human body that sometimes uh, the nerves go through the muscle, which in this case, the supinator uh, uh, muscle has the radial nerve embedded in it. And if you co-contract the forearm or squeeze the forearm, uh, because you have to stabilize the instrument, you will have a, uh, an entrapment of the radial nerve through the supinator muscle called supinator syndrome. So there's an example of a straightforward um, injury related to uh, static loading of the clarinet. Well, I don't know how many clicks or how much time you spent on your computer or your phone or your iPad today. <clears throat> but again, we're using devices all the time. And carpal tunnel syndrome is very common because of the median nerve that crosses the wrist, which is involved in grasping uh, function, but the entrapment of the uh, median nerve is very common in those uh, individuals who use tools, uh, vibrating tools, uh, repetitive use with computers, and of course, to a lesser degree, musical instruments. But it's not the most common uh, type of physical injury we see in the clinic. More commonly, we have what's called proximal entrapment or trap entrapment of the nerves and blood vessels up in the neck and shoulder region, mostly related to tension and posture. So you can see the yellow structures again are the nerves, the red structure coming just under the collarbone is the artery and the return is the vein. So when you have tight muscles, such as the scalene muscles in the neck and the sternocleidomastoid muscles, whether you're in flexion, playing a wind instrument, or in lateral flexion, squeezing an upper string, uh, you will uh, be at risk of uh, entrapment or compression of the brachial plexus uh, up, up in this area. But this is often overlooked uh, clinically, uh, mostly because um, the healthcare professionals do not examine you or understand the unique nature of the ergonomics of playing various musical instruments. So <clears throat> you can be diagnosed with carpal tunnel, get a test, but completely miss out on the proximal entrapment component of the injury and therefore miss the treatment plan, which is uh, correcting posture uh, and uh, improving uh, motor control of the supporting structures of the body involved in performance. And here comes the fun part called motor control problems or so-called focal dystonia. In the upper part of the um, slide, you can see a normal brain scan with uh, blood flowing on both left and right sides. This is from the foot view looking uh, upwards. So left is on the right side of the screen. And you can see the musician moving the right hand and blood, uh, blood flow on the left side of the brain. That's normal. Uh, and the bottom so two, two uh, uh, pictures, you'll see that the, the distribution of uh, activation of the brain on the left side while trying to move the right hand is abnormal or smudged. And that's what happens uh, uh, now that we have brain scanners and can study can study focal dystonia. How the field started was uh, Leon Fleischer and Gary Grafman actually asking for help by, uh, from Alice Brand from Brenner um, and Richard Letterman. And um, we just had a, a, a nice lecture follow up a few weeks ago from Dr. Eckhart Altenmuller in Hanover, Germany, who um, can be credited for doing the, much of the incredible uh, bench work uh, research both clinically as well as um, uh, imaging wise and in terms of this uh, very troubling uh, condition, uh, loss of motor control. So do not forget the central nervous system or the brain in involved in these types of injuries. 
uh, vocalists. Uh, don't know if you're singing there, but very important. Uh, we know about uh, vocal strain and the importance of looking at the vocal cords, which specialized ENT or voice clinics uh, are doing with now uh, much less uh, invasive uh, uh, technology. So you, on the left, you can see the, the inflammation of the vocal cords. Uh, but on the right, uh, unfortunately with chronic inflammation, you can uh, develop uh, uh, aberrations of cell growth, commonly known as cancer. Um, obviously in, the, in popular musicians, um, much higher risk with tobacco use. Um, and of course with drinking as well, anything that creates chronic inflammation. Big issue in, in singers is the reflux because of the stress and, or bad diet. And this can uh, set up a, a bad situation in the vocal apparatus. So if in doubt, always have a look and, and uh, also get the correct imaging to make sure there's nothing sinister happening. Uh, moving uh, somewhat uh, northward from the voice into the ears. This is what it looks like in your cochlea, which is the inner ear. Uh, this unfortunately is a poor little chinchilla who's been exposed to uh, probably modern music for four weeks, commonly known as impact noise. And you can see the hair cells, the inner and outer hair cells uh, broken off. So it's much like what a tornado would look like uh, uh, in the last few weeks. So you can see the problem is that when the hair cells get damaged, they may pop up again if it's the damage is slight or they're totally destroyed. And therefore you get uh, the hearing loss as well as the ringing in the ears, so-called tinnitus. So this is uh, related to the dosimetry, uh, how much noise exposure or sound exposure you have. So generally these are the laws uh, across the land. Uh, based on some of the research and it's uh, 40 hours per week, 85 decibels. So how loud is 85 decibels? Well, it's sort of uh, maybe a vacuum cleaner. Um, you can have that exposure and increase the, the maximum tolerance by three decibels, so-called 3 dB exchange rule. Uh, and then you get the 2.5 hours, hours per week at 97 dB. Okay, that's great. Uh, what do we do with that in a symphony orchestra? Well, basically if we measured at the National Youth Orchestra way back uh, and when they were in Kingston, Debussy La Mer, in the concert hall without air conditioning, uh, we had dosimeters across the stage and basically it was about 110 decibels um, right, right across the orchestra. So you can sort of see, well, wait a sec, 97 to 110. Man, that's just a few minutes at Debussy. Okay, now what do we do? That unfortunately is the problem in, in musical exposure. We just can't um, put in uh, high attenuating earplugs because you can't hear what you're performing. So this is a big, big issue. Uh, uh, that's uh, crept across many of the symphony orchestras and, and as you know, um, uh, require uh, a lot of hearing surveillance and um, uh, preventive me measures, not just earplugs, but uh, other ways to mitigate the potential damage. A study uh, just quickly on that issue, uh, they, in that orchestral study, basically they had uh, dosimeters, much like used in, in uh, mining and radiation, basically on a weekly basis by Tuesday, most of the orchestra musicians had exceeded their legal limit. So uh, it's, it's not an issue that uh, should be forgotten. Now let's get it into the basic science of uh, musical processing. This is a uh, very interesting work from Gottfried Schlag, who's both a neurologist and a very high level uh, organist uh, um, who studied the brain circuitry of uh, both musicians and non-musicians. He's also the head of uh, stroke rehabilitation at Harvard in Boston. On the left, you see the arcuate fasciculus, which is the auditory motor tract which, which you guys all have, you know, huge ones, I do too. Uh, and uh, you can see how thick and complex that motor, auditory motor tract is 
on the left. On the right is a non-musician. I can make some political jokes, which I won't, since we're going public here. And you can see how small and clean it is. So that might be an accountant or a lawyer, who knows. But um, if you want to play Brahms and Chopin, I pick on the left. Uh, so that's really interesting work. We are very structurally different uh, thanks to our musical training and should be proud of it. Uh, move just down the street from um, uh, headquarters uh, in Montreal is Rob Zatori's work in the Montreal Neurological. He, he's Argentinian, loves tango. And what he did was blend the MRI, functional MRI, that's magnetic resonance imaging scans of the brain with PET scans, positron emission tomography, which uh, can look at the uh, activity of dopamine, which you probably know is pleasure hormone or reward hormone uh, in real time, amazing technology. So what he did across uh, the bottom are, are uh, the levels of dopamine in various areas of the brain. The pictures are up in the top right corner. And uh, he's identified the so-called anticipation phase, kind of, kind of uh, moving and grooving. So the caudate uh, nucleus uh, in the light uh, purple is where you kind of move and groove and the uh, dark purple is the nucleus accumbens. So when you hit that magic moment, which might happen in Brahms Symphony Number no. 2, or in my case, uh, addicted to uh, the wander fantasy of Schubert, then you get these bursts of dopamine. Okay, so that's why we do this. It's not for the money, it's because of dopamine. We love it. Uh, my prevention issue on alcohol and drugs, once you start fooling around with these drugs and getting the peak experience, as many musicians have, um, this alters your response to Brahms number two or um, Purple Haze by Jimi Hendrix. You're not gonna get that uh, response and it uh, swamps this and alters your uh, pleasure response to music. So. That's one reason uh, for not doing too much booze or any other substances of mischief, uh, because you don't want to lose that Brahms feeling. And uh, go back in history at the same place, Montreal Neurological. Uh, this is a mapping of the human brain surface area. This is Wilder Penfield's brilliant work of the 30s. And you'll see the homunculus is what he called it and uh, the big area of the surface of the brain dedicated to the face and upper extremity, okay? So guess what? Uh, we combine stress and activation of the face and upper extremity region to uh, play musical instruments. Uh, then we're dealing with a big, big uh, part of the uh, brain function. Donald Hebb, um, in, way back when, uh, wrote a very obscure paper, which has now become the calling card for uh, cognitive neuroscience. What fires together gets wired together. So remember that what fires together gets wired together. Way back when, use it or lose it. Well, that's why we practice. We're always afraid that we won't be any good today if we don't practice. Well, it still stands. So that's what it looks like. And uh, he did some interesting experiments. You can look it up in the library or check it out on YouTube. And this is the burning toast experiments where they actually stimulated the surface of the brain with electrodes and the hand would twitch or the mouth would twitch, etc. cetera. So uh, it probably would not pass ethics approval these days, but in the thirties, that's what uh, Penfield did. There are other contributors to the uh, 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 science, both uh, research and, and, and uh, clinical science. Gabor Mate is a colleague out in uh, Vancouver uh, who wrote a book called When the Body Says No, The Stress-Disease Connection. That was way, way back 10 years ago. But uh, at that time, very controversial. Uh, Gabor is still very active. So you can just uh, search his name and you'll see his recent documentary called The Wisdom of Trauma is absolutely brilliant and, and very well done. So what he's done is, is, is uh, made it quite accessible to, to think about health in context, not just of genetics, but also of their social and psychological well-being. 
and to look at that in a biopsychosocial model. Um, the only thing to really add to that is us as artists. Authentic self-expression is the key, including but not limited to artistic self-expression. Okay, so your interpretations of Chopin and Brahms may be just wonderful in the sweet spot, but your whole life may be chaos or there's other issues going on. So uh, it's very important to, to take a broad biopsychosocial view of oneself and of course of one's uh, artistic environment. So the actual physiology is uh, made a lot clear by a number of uh, contributors, Robert Sapolsky from Stanford, Bessel van der Kolk from Boston, as well as Gabor from Vancouver. <clears throat> and they've coined, which has become very popular concept called the mind-body connection, which involves some chemistry. So uh, I'll try to go through this without boring you too much, but basically, the brain is hardwired to the body. There is no separation. Uh, that is all fake news. Uh, it's amazing how much fake news there is in science. And uh, what happens is the brain, the mind is connected to the body through the stress uh, response. And the adrenals, which are two little organs that sit on top of our kidneys are very responsive to the signals through the vagus nerve, which I'll get into. And what does it respond to? It responds to who you are, what your experiences in childhood, in your studies, in your work, your personal life, and sets up a circuit um, that's there to protect you. Okay, so you, you might have a chronic stress response to protect you from COVID right now, or a chronic stress response trying to make sense of uh, what we should do opening up uh, the venues uh, given the threat of uh, wave four of the Delta variant. So there's a good example. Nobody really wants to get sick and, and have long haul or die, but we're, we're learning about that. And then uh, each individual will, based on their experience, will set up their own uh, response to whatever their survival threat may be. Steve Porges, uh, another uh, famous contributor, has actually looked at the mind-body connection. And, and uh, I've summarized his life work with a bit of a joke, but it's no joke. What happens to the vagus stays in the vagus. So when everything is wonderful, all things are bright and beautiful, life is perfect, we won the Stanley Cup, we don't need to worry about it. When we're in the playoffs, we mobilize a anxiety or panic response, or if you're in a uh, audition for uh, uh, going to Curtis or Juilliard, well, obviously you'll have a sympathetic fight or flight response. If it's chronic, okay, there's uh, chronic issues with, that you're dealing with. As I mentioned in some of the studies alluded to, um, financial issues or uh, adverse working uh, situations, you feel trapped, then the vagus gets tired, you start to go into immobilization, you develop chronic pain and depression and all these adverse health outcomes. So it's a nice model to, to look at the uh, uh, system, the main operating system of the human body and remember what happens to the vagus stays in the vagus. So this is really you know, mind boggling, but it really is quite simple. Putting all these concepts together, uh, um, Sapolsky and, and crew have termed the uh, phrase allostatic overload. So your mind body connection is in a state of a chronic overload. And how does this work? The way the survival system is set up, there's a rapid response to a survival threat. It's uh, feed forward, uh, there's no boundaries and therefore gets stuck on and no off. So if you're a pop music fan like I am, remember what goes up must come down. It's the normal response, blood, sweat and tears, but up, up and away is the chronic stress response and there's no way down. So the therapeutic trick is to analyze what happened and to find ways to mitigate that allostatic overload to bring the level down. In the schematic, you can see the adrenals wired into the brain, these, uh, what 
fires together, gets wired together and affecting the immune system the, and developing inflammatory cytokines, which you might've noticed is actually the end response of, of COVID, the so-called cytokine storm. So it should sound a bit more familiar to you. Uh, the bottom line, how much stress can we take? Each year of stress equals six years of cellular aging. So it's not your chronological age you report to CRA uh, for your taxes. It's actually how much wear and tear is on your physiologic system that's more important uh, here. And it unfortunately uh, ends up with adverse health outcomes in terms of cardiovascular system, stroke, diabetes, cancer, arthritis, MS, and dementia, and many other adverse health outcomes. Think through that list just in the bottom right and your favorite musician, whether they be Glenn Gould or B.B. King or whoever, uh, Jacqueline Dupre, et cetera. And you can sort of say, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Um, so uh, right at a very, very cellular level, I know I'm getting very technical here, but it's quite important just to get a feel for this. These are uh, the glial cells, not that funny, it's not very glial. Uh, I call them the three stooges cells. In the middle, you'll see the astrocyte, which regulates a lot of the synaptic connect connections in the nervous system, the so-called synapses and all the various uh, neurotransmitters, serotonin, etc. On the right, uh, the guy with the fuzzy hair there is the microglia, which are basically the main controller of the immune system, which uh, controls a lot of the inflammatory response related to stress. On the left is uh, somebody uh, that looks like Curly. Uh, if you know who the Three Stooges are, uh, really not funny to rile up Curly because this results in demyelinization or breakage in the conducting material in, uh, along the neural pathways, which uh, gives rise to many of the chronic neurological diseases we see, uh, which are not so good. Uh, is this again more fake news? Well, it's been published in pretty prestigious journals and now it's become very in vogue because of the uh, uh, horrific response to the um, uh, COVID uh, spike protein. Uh, now you'll see, depending on whatever your stressors, whether it be physical stressors or psychological stressors, mounting a, uh, a big immune response um, and uh, generation of inflammatory cytokines. Now cyto means cell, kinds means killer. So they're something we don't wanna uh, mess with. So on the on the mental health side of things, you can see on the left is the excitatory pathways on the right, sorry, on the right is the excitatory pathways and on the left, the inhibitory pathways. And you see it's a delicate balance, a harmonious balance, major and minor, yin and yang between how excited we get or how inhibited we get. So that's how the nervous system works, like a brake and accelerator. And the, the art of therapy is to, to find that magic balance, to be in tune with how excited or how depressed we get or how involved or detached we get. And so there's some uh, very complex uh, biochemistry. So anybody interested in uh, continuing your music but getting into the science of this, uh, we're welcome. And again, all this is published in Nature. How does this relate to muscle tension? Another uh, very fun guy uh, from San Diego, Richard Gerberch, uh, studied this muscle stress connection and identified spindle cells in the muscle, which get all excited when you get stressed. So there's a background story to uh, everybody's muscle tension and also muscle pain and interference. So he's, uh, it makes sort of sense. Why would the muscle system have the fight or flight system embedded without thinking? Uh, and that's the good side of catching a puck, uh, carry price and the bad side of having chronic pain and not being able to um, play your sports or musical instrument. And again, fake news, uh, no Logia out of Harvard uh, examine patients with chronic low back pain versus those control subjects without. And lo and behold, with the uh, brain scan showed activation in the pain centers 
which you can see in the scans above, uh, right where the, uh, you'd expect the three Stooges cells to be quite hyperactive. So that's been validated out of the Harvard uh, group. And the same group looked at uh, patients with uh, so-called fibromyalgia, which is an inflammatory chronic pain syndrome of muscles, uh, primarily. And they identified these are <clears throat> the red areas that are related to hyperactivity in the nervous system, areas in the sensory motor area, as well as other motor planning areas of those patients in pink with pain versus the controls blue without pain. So there's a significant difference of those with uh, muscle pain syndromes and healthy controls. So again, uh, uh, this is not fake news uh, based on the objective data. So how does this relate to your environment? Uh, researcher out of UCLA, George Slavich, was brilliant in setting up these experiments, got his psychology students, paid them $20 to participate in this somewhat cruel study. Uh, so what he did was expose them to a, a, a task of counting backwards from a thousand uh, minus seven, and then you can try that at speed, except what he did was have people yell at you and tell you to hurry up and criticize you and say you're uh, too slow or whatever. And then he also asked them to do an impromptu five minute uh, speech while being videoed with a fake uh, uh, a jury and uh, hurling uh, all kinds of bad things towards you, much like in the movie called Whiplash, uh, which you might have seen with the drummer uh, trying to play jazz while the conductor's yelling at them. So what he found was that uh, the mind-body system was activated into survival threat mode and that certain areas of the brain uh, were activated. No surprise, the hub of the mind, the anterior cingulate cortex uh, was activated to say what's going on to protect yourself and the insula of the body maps acted such that uh, the uh, psychological maltreatment was the same response as uh, physical abuse. So it's like, wow. So that was the first hint that maybe uh, our mind body uh, systems as uh, musicians, especially in music education could be sensitive and vulnerable to targeted humiliating criticism. So it became policy in 2012. This is again, old news, not fake news by a McMaster group uh, led and became policy by the American Academy of Pediatrics that psychological maltreatment is as harmful as physical assault. And the components of that abuse uh, is characterized there. It doesn't have to be a, a punch in the head like in hockey, it can be uh, verbal abuse. And now you're seeing uh, in sports trying to cut down on some of that and now recent uh, issues arising at Curtis and now University of Toronto and in orchestras uh, right across the country and the world uh, uh, making a call on uh, various individuals of power um, uh, violating some of those boundary uh, issues and setting new policies. Now is this just something that uh, we should just be aware of and take seriously? In the public health world, the risk is similar uh, uh, number-wise to that uh, related to tobacco and asbestos. So in my career, turning a back on the tobacco industry has not been part of my uh, uh, experience and also uh, not just uh, turning a blind eye to asbestos, even though you can't see the particles. Uh, that cr create the cancer. So the same with psychological abuse, unless you're listening for it, you may miss it. And so now we're listening for it and, and making a call on it, which is uh, uh, great to see. Not uh, great for those who are responsible, but at least uh, we're now much more aware uh, of the adverse psychological environment in music education, as well as uh, in orchestras. So bottom line, uh, is this for real? Does it cause real structural damage? And the answer is yes. This is a group from University of Western Ontario, Western University now, Claire Payne's uh, group. And you can see the fractures, I called it uh, uh, tears of my fears. So these are, are 
uh, comparison brain scans of uh, kids uh, who are exposed to parental verbal aggression. And in this slide, uh, uh, pure uh, verbal uh, bullying. And you can see the uh, areas of uh, differentials between those exposed and not exposed. So this is real well done science with objective uh, neurological outcomes. So, and how do we explain some of the chronic uh, health outcomes? Well, I call them my friends, the four Teletubbies. Uh, Elizabeth Blackburn and Alyssa Apple got, actually got the Nobel Prize in 2009 for this uh, amazing research, well published and well accepted. The factors such as seeing red, ruminating, threat to ego and negative mind wandering are highly associated with shortening of the telomeres, which are protective ends of your chromosomes. So you'd really don't wanna mess with your chromosomes, right? But the problem is with chronic stress, it actually shortens and makes the cells become more vulnerable. They may um, uh, mutate just like the virus, COVID virus does and turn into cancer cells or the cell itself just might uh, age and die. So that explains many of the adverse health outcomes that uh, I showed you in the original uh, uh, musician data. And Mo Moshe Ziff, again, just down the road at McGill, has uh, been working on the epigenetics of stress. So on the left is happy monkey. Uh, everything's going great in life and the actual genome map is mostly green because you are safely attached and really happy and have lots of oxytocin, uh, love hormone or attachment hormone circulating. On the right, you have unhappy monkey that just got turfed out of an audition or lost a competition. And suddenly the gene map changes from green to red uh, because of the drop in oxytocin or the stress, the stress response. So um, again, uh, promoting lots of Canadian research that can be applied to uh, our field of interest. So coming back home in Hamilton here, this uh, little clinic, um, what have we found? Hmm. So there's a uh, scale uh, or a uh, concept called the Adverse Childhood Events Questionnaire, which is the simple questions, uh, uh, 10 simple questions of whether you have been exposed to some adversity when you were young. We administer that at, at the uh, initial consultation. And we reviewed the last uh, 200 or so patients since we uh, haven't been quite as busy clinically uh, during the COVID shutdown. This is what we found, that our patients in our uh, current uh, uh, clinic had a much higher prevalence of ACE uh, events, uh, that is uh, two, three, and four plus than the general population. So uh, that's something to watch for, uh, you would think, in patients that declare themselves and seek help for their injuries and illnesses. Well, we actually statistically analyze what uh, the ACE scores um, we're explaining in terms of our patient uh, population. And the ACE scores explained uh, uh, high variability uh, in their stress scores and in their overall depression, anxiety, stress scores in their anxiety scores and sleep scores, uh, as less so in their pain intensity and did not explain a lot of variability in their pain interference or depression scores. So we're uh, looking at that more closely in terms of obviously stress reactivity and putting a, uh, some clinical data based on this basic science I've presented so far. And what are these ACE scores to look for? Um, experience of violence, abuse, neglect, witnessing violence in the home or community, having a family member attempt or die by suicide, substance misuse, mental health problems, and parental or family disruption, as well as uh, jail or uh, prison. So that was a questionnaire designed uh, in the 80s by Vincent Felitti, F-E-L-E-T-T-I. You can look that up. Uh, 
and it's uh, my extending that concept it also applies to educational adverse events as well as occupational adverse events and of course personal adverse events throughout your lifetime because life does not stop as you know at 17 it carries on in, in our lives so again data to to uh, support that uh, uh, having a good look uh, at your stress profile is probably better for your health than otherwise. And what do we know from the Felitti A study? Does it, what does it have to do with your health? It has huge amount in terms of your uh, life experience and your quality of life. Um, and here are some of the adverse health outcomes that are being tracked by this massive study of close to 20,000 uh, persons in Southern California all funded by NIH. So uh, issues, obviously mental health issues, infectious disease, chronic disease, uh, as well as uh, addiction, et cetera. So how do we perfect, uh, protect ourselves? So Professor Nim Chimsky, my stage name says, uh, we know that targeted humiliating criticism or bad THC uh, increases your risk of adverse cortisol events by 22 fold. So can we find personal protective equipment? It's not so easy if the conductor or your teacher uh, is not is quote violating some of those uh, standards, whether it be physical or psychological. Uh, we just can't put on a set of noise canceling headphones and tune it out. So what else can we do? So I'll leave that with you in terms of uh, uh, sorting out these preventive interventions. So overall, uh, summarizing going back um, to where we were in the 80s, um, we looked at simple risk factors and published this in Canadian Association, a medical association journal. And a change of teacher or instrument is a big deal. Uh, intense preparation for a performance is a big deal. Preparing new and difficult repertoire is a big deal. And prolonged periods of performance without rest is a big deal. It seems like common sense looking back on it uh, 30 years, but still uh, in the uh, summer camps, so whether you're, I have performed at Toronto Summer Music Festival, same thing, you know, big pieces, jam practicing, playing all night, rehearsing all day, and finally performing. Uh, maybe you might want to revisit how I prepare and train for that. Same applies on a group basis um, during these big summer festivals. And we do have studies now uh, showing what happens on you know short three or four week summer festivals that's been done. There now have been smaller studies looking at the effect of some of the issues uh, amongst uh, music students as well as other symphony orchestras around the world in terms of some of these risk factors and they actually hold true uh, to today. And the only issue is how do we mitigate some of the risks involved? Not so easy, okay? You do need to upgrade your instruments and they are very different new pieces and you may get funding for you know, contemporary uh, pieces. And of course, uh, with limited funding, you're gonna have to practice um, long periods. So the pressure comes back on the musician. How do we develop more resilience uh, to some of the challenges we have uh, performing. So bottom uh, line prevention is taking your rest breaks, stretching, exercises, pay attention to your ergonomics, and of course, pay attention to your uh, physical and emotional well-being. Don't play through the pain, get some help. Uh, so we do have some uh, uh, ideas how to do that. So when patients come in, we have what's called the APE lab, the Artist Psychophysiology and Ergonomics Lab. I can show you a video clip of what that is a bit later if somebody's interested. But the goal of this is to create uh, increased resilience of the, of the artist or the athlete under adverse uh, situations. So we, in the lab, we can create uh, artificial situations of um, to stress uh, the uh, performer and uh, see uh, how they how they do, much like a test track. Uh, 
Okay, so the, the concepts uh, of increasing your resilience as a performer are as follows, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Alignment, so you know about Alexander and all these uh, postural uh, concepts, breathing. Uh, so hopefully you're more tuned into how quickly you're breathing, how deeply you're breathing. Your overall coordination, how efficient is your technique? Diet is very, very crucial. What you feed your body uh, highly determines your athletic or your musical performance. Uh, exercise, how aerobically fit you are, how pliable and, and healthy those muscles uh, and nerves are. Focus, your ability to tune out extraneous fake news and just focus at the task. And of course, your overall end goals is very important. So in my game, I'm not necessary about winning that one award, but overall, what can you do to not get injured in pursuit of that uh, overall prize is far more important. So some of the techniques we use, uh, which I can get into and show you is uh, if we were live, but we're not, uh, surface EMG, which measures the electrical activity or tension. I have motion capture, which is, uh, uh, can show you what angles move and acceleration. Of course, audio uh, and video feedback. Uh, we can put on little sensors to measure your heart rate variability, how it increases and decreases in a healthy or an unhealthy way. Neurofeedback, we now have gadgets to measure your brain frequencies in different areas. And the idea there is to get it calmed down into the zone of optimal uh, focus or so-called uh, uh, flow, um, and so we can train you to do that. We have uh, uh, psychotherapy, which we, we refer out. Uh, I think one of your guest speakers is a, a wonderful psychotherapist, um, and there are various techniques, mindfulness-based, uh, uh, stress reduction, cognitive behavioral, as well as uh, psychodynamic uh, types of therapy. Uh, we have experimented with direct current stimulation as uh, Alton Mueller's group in Germany has done. Uh, we have acupuncture as well as a wide myriad of medications if necessary. So in conceptualizing this and putting it into a treatment package, uh, I, uh, since I'm a 12 tone composer, had nothing else to do with no, nothing to write about. So we constructed a 12 tone system of tune up targets uh, with uh, the, the hopes that you would improve your performance uh, under exposure to stress. And we used the prolonged exposure CBT model and cover some of the concepts we've outlined uh, previously in the presentation here. Now here's an example of uh, a piano player named Garrick Olson. Uh, you might know of him as one of the, certainly in the top 10 in the world. But what's interesting about Garrick, other than his six foot four frame and huge hands, and his mastery of the Chopin repertoire, and, and also now exploring Scriabin and a few other things he's up to. But he meditates every day, he does yoga, he um, has his weekly massage, he's a fairly uh, happy in his diet and he's very comfortable with his own uh, political and gender issues and uh, runs his life doing 200 concerts a year. The other interesting thing is that he did win the Chopin when he was 18, beating Manny Axe and, and Uchida, but also he's never been injured. So that was the reason why I worked with Garrick to say why on earth somebody working this hard, other than having big hands and amazing technique, did not get injured. And there's his scans right there with his muscle sensors on in meditation before he plays. Absolutely dead quiet. So he's able to calm his body and tension down to nothing, which is amazing. Then he got a challenge from uh, uh, the experimenter, happened to be me, saying, uh, why don't you just uh, pick up the Chopin Ballade number one, made famous in the pianist, or so-called one wrong note, you die, literally. And then full full uh, physiology starts firing out. You can see the tracings in his shoulders. 
uh, the upper two tracing left and right, and then in his forearms left and right. And you can see how nice and clean the muscle recruitment patterns are. They're on and off and on and off. And then, you know, if you happen to be sitting six feet away from him, it's pretty amazing to hear his power coming out and the accuracy uh, of his playing, which of course is Garrick Olson. So some of the other interesting developments in the clinic uh, is obviously examining the monkey mind, I call it, and as other uh, pharmaceutical uh, interventions that could regulate some of the uh, treatment outcomes we're looking at, that is musculoskeletal pain, intensity interference, uh, stress reactivity, anxiety, depression, as well as sleep scores. So uh, learning from ancient Chinese medicine, no, do not smoke the whole package of joints uh, from the dummy on the right side of the screen. Uh, we use oral products produced by licensed producers in Canada. It's totally legal. So uh, an informed uh, cannabis prescriber will show you how to use it safely, primarily CBD, cannabidiol, which is the non-psychoactive component of the cannabis uh, plant, THC, is the active which you might want to use for some sleep regulation or at a party which is totally legal. The only thing about THC do not drive and if you are, have a history of uh, psychosis and stuff don't mess around with it and it's very important to use the right hybrids etc to get the right effect. So CBD cannabidiol is our main anti-inflammatory and neural system regulator. So to summarize, the prevention of overuse is the control of use. This goes back to uh, Hunter Fry in the 1970s, and it still applies today in the 2021s. Uh, prevention is a difficult concept to get across to those who haven't really encountered overuse uh, uh, issues uh, in their music. Uh, we have had courses, of course, at the Glen Gould I talked about, and many other courses are starting up <clears throat> in, in Montreal, of course, Faculty of Music right across the country in the States. Uh, we have an initiative going with the National Association of Schools of Music, uh, and it's now part of their policy um, to accreditation uh, policy that they need to have some health and safety embedded in their education and pedagogical uh, uh, curriculum uh, across the 644 schools affiliated with NASM. Uh, other initiatives with the College uh, Music Society and Music uh, MTNA, Music Teachers National Association. Uh, we have uh, collaborations ongoing uh, to look at auditory health, physical health, as well as uh, mental health. So it's a definitely busy time and work in progress uh, in the field. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, we have lots of time for questions and uh, I can explore them with you uh, as you see fit. Uh, make sure you move and have a breath. If you need a, uh, a restroom break, please take it. And uh, I'll be more than happy to take your questions and debate some of these uh, concepts uh, that I've uh, presented to you so far. Thanks. So I will now X out of here. Great. I have one question and one chat. I'll open up the question. Okay, you mentioned starting courses across Canada. It won't be me uh, to be coming from the school administration. Are there and will there be a course at McGill like this? Um, there was a very active group at McGill. I, sadly, I've uh, forgotten her name. She was a student there who played violin, got injured uh, and uh, started a group uh, years ago that I think is still very active, um, trying to uh, get a core course going. I know that Isabel Cossette at University of Montreal is very active uh, and, uh, and I will be hopefully presenting in Montreal at the end of October 
at the um, performance science uh, conference uh, uh, with a number of uh, esteemed colleagues about uh, making these issues aware, increasing awareness of these issues to administrations across uh, the world and uh, um, hopefully uh, uh, making the change uh, uh, to implement the course. My experience at the Glenn Gould uh, was a lot of fun that was started in 2009 uh, at the request of Jim and Agdeson, who's still the Dean. And uh, I did that for six years, uh, fighting the traffic from Hamilton to Toronto. Uh, early on, uh, the experience was, I found personally very exciting and positive because it was a small group. We could really work as a small group, um, uh, measuring heart rate variability, uh, muscle tension, getting into people's narrative in a safe space. When this, the class got too big into the 30s and 40s, much like this group, it lost its its uh, shine, uh, certainly from my perspective, because we didn't have the the one-on-one -on -one kind of, it became more didactic. And you can probably tell I'm not a big fan of didactic presentations uh, uh, because they tend to be you know, too general and not problem specific. So we were able to identify the, the narrative, some of these stress narratives within the students, uh, measure them with all the gadgets I've, I've shown you, and then actually get to work in class and, and uh, fix them, not in a patient doctor relationship, but more in a problem solving uh, supportive environment. So that was a lot of fun. So that's been my experience. Again, one of the issues is faculty and some of the, your faculty hopefully are listening in you know there's a kind of still i think a stigma uh hopefully uh you know we don't want to uh, be associated with uh, causing injuries or being a bad teacher uh, we just want our students to be successful happy and win all the awards so that that old school kind of uh, make it or break it uh, philosophy is still is very endemic in pedagogy. So again, more conversations like this or face to face, hopefully, uh, with in various venues, uh, we can get to, I think somebody just flashed the uh, link to the McGill uh, students uh, uh, connection there. And uh, you can search that out. Uh, I don't see any more uh, so thank you, Alexander, uh, for that question. I'll just flip over to the chat box here. Uh, Pace, uh, any advice about dry mouth as it affects wind and brass players? Well, in general terms, um, uh, hydration is actually critical as it is in athletes and uh, in orchestra. You know, some of you have uh, clanky water bottles there, but again, afraid to drink too much because you have to take a pee break. So these are some of the issues. So generally, in my experience, most of the musicians have been practicing, uh, the students have been practicing in a, and performing and rehearsing in a dehydrated uh, state. Uh, that's one thing. Now the stress connection, of course, uh, you're probably not gonna be foaming at the mouth when you get stressed, unless you're ready for a fight, you're gonna get dry mouth. That's a anticholinergic effect. Uh, it can be from medication side effects, uh, but mostly because of the anxiety response. So again, getting back to your mindfulness meditation, getting back to your heart rate variability, getting into that zone relaxed, uh, calm focused state. Next question, uh, who's that from? Can't see, uh, I guess it's from Luca. Uh, what is your prescribed length of music practice session for a wind player? Excellent, we do not have any time limits, um, but uh, when you start to feel symptoms of your injury, PRMD injury, it's probably too late because the inflammatory reaction has started to happen. That is why your question is so important uh, because playing the oboe, Luca, is obviously a very demanding instrument. So is a bassoon because of double reed. And um, when you're tired, that's the main issue. So aerobic fitness, musculoskeletal fitness is your best bet to increase your practice tolerance as well as your performance in rehearsal and, 
and uh, full uh, concert uh, ability. Unfortunately, many of the big pieces, uh, the ones we love the best are big monsters and long ones. And like myself, we're guilty of practicing the whole thing every day uh, for six hours. And that's what happens, you get injured. Okay, next question. One of the common problems among flautists is having pain in the left hand because different posture compared to other wind instruments. How can we find solutions for this problem? Okay, great. So I'm gonna move my question and answer box away so I can see what I'm doing. So playing flute, okay, is this way, not the other side. It's, okay, and see what happens to the left hand. Goes into extension and radial deviation because of the straight line and support of the instrument with the thumb under, both thumb unders. Okay, so when the wrist bends this way and you operate the fingers, especially this way, curling the extrinsic muscles, which are in the forearm, we get a lot of tension and therefore an inflammatory reaction. Ideally, the ergonomist would say, we'll play the flute like this, okay? So the bioengineer would say, okay, design that. The trouble is when you're playing this, the angle of the flute is that way and this way, and you can't maintain a neutral uh, uh, left wrist uh, position. The other issue is the inline uh, G keys, sometimes open holes. So that makes the angulation even more different. And if you came to a doctor who said, well, you need an offset G key and plug the holes, you'd be running away from that doctor. So I don't say that, okay? The problem is that is something recognized and you can try to twist around and, and, and move things around. Jeannie Backstresser who had all kinds of uh, arthritis problems. She went to a flute maker and modified the keys uh, so that it had extenders on it. So it more comfortably fit her hand to deal with her particular issues. Uh, we have modified the head joint to a 30 degree hockey stick looking thing so that the arm is down. Other patients have transformed. There's actually uh, an upright flute that looks like a question mark and you can play it uh, up and down, which again, takes away the wrist problem, but again, looks really funny. Um, so there are many ways to, to, to uh, try to solve the problem or so-called skin the cat. Next question from Grace, uh, which advice uh, would you give uh, to a wind player whose vellum tends to weaken easily, meaning that the pressure of the air makes it so that the air leaks through the nose? That's a really great question, a tough one. First, I would get a good ear, nose and throat, otolaryngology opinion to look at the uh, velopharyngeal incompetence syndrome and actually validate that's actually what's happening and uh, developing uh, some exercises. Some speech and language pathologists are, are uh, <clears throat> good at giving you exercises to improve your uh, uh, airway um, integrity when there's that back pressure. Not an easy problem to, to deal with. Next question to all panelists, which advice would you give to a wind player? No, oh, we did that one, sorry. Do you have any advice for violists or violinists in order to prevent hearing loss? If they need to have their left ear close to their instrument for, for how many hours per day? What can be done in order not to compromise the quality of the sound? Brilliant question. So my esteemed uh, colleague, Marshall Chasen, uh, did try to look at that by putting a probe mic into the left ear, which is a little mini microphone inserted through a tube, while uh, one of the prominent Toronto Symphony uh, players played. And much to our chagrin, the sound level, uh, sound pressure level at the uh, eardrum in the left ear while playing uh, was uh, very high in the order of 100, 110, 120 decibels, no surprise, okay? No surprise at all. 
So we have tried various ways to protect the left ear, of course, by dampening that with an earplug, a standard foamy earplug, one cuts out the richness of the overtone and it sounds like you're, you're playing a piece of cardboard. So it's, it's kind of brutal. Uh, Marshall brilliantly has uh, uh, tried that while plugging the left ear using a passive, uh, uh, like a hearing aid device, uh, transmitting the acoustic information to the right ear and trying to maintain the, the nice overtones of your Strat or Guanari. That sort of works okay if you have a big lower frequency instrument like a cello or a bass. It does not work well with a violin or viola because you are very dependent on that burst of high, high frequency overtone material, which is why you pay you know, three or 10, 10 million bucks for a nice violin. And of course, with your fancy bow. It's a tough one, uh, especially in the orchestral environment where you're just being bombarded by Wagner and et cetera uh, all the time. So you need both ears. You need to hear your instrument. You need to hear what's going on around you. So just plugging in uh, ER15s or ER25 um, uh, earplugs is, has not been very um, uh, satisfactory. Uh, that's uh, Ian O'Brien's work. Uh, but there are ways to get used to it, ways to produce. Obviously, if you're doing 1812 overture and the cannons go off or doing a big taiko, uh, uh, you know, with Japanese drummers banging away uh, to your right or left, use your hearing protectors because it's not that critical, okay? Uh, when you hear the cannons go off. So you just need to be warned and uh, stay aware and, you know, put your plugs in as best you can. Do acoustic barriers work? And that's another question that came up. And uh, to some degree they are. So you're now you're seeing a lot of plexiglass, you know, putting the rock drummer in a plexiglass cage where they probably should be, but, um, and then protecting the woodwind section and the back of the string section in some of the pop concerts. Again, that's helpful. Um, any way you can decrease getting out of the so-called line of fire. Um, those who are directly in front of the brass section, uh, just to um, say hi to Pace there in the good old days. Um, so you'll see at the Concertgebouw, you know, uh, leveled uh, risers, etc. So that the brass section fires above the heads of the folks in front of them. Um, so that, that can uh, decrease and every dB uh, you get, not just time, but the level, overall level uh, will spare you a lot of agony in terms of hearing loss. You can arm yourself uh, on your cell phone. I guess you can't see my fancy new cell phone here. I'm proud of it, still don't know how to use it. Um, and there's a app called Sound Log, S-O-U-N-D-L-O-G. Uh, you can get downloaded for free from NIOSH and it gives you real time dosimetry about your sound exposure. So that's really fantastic. So you can really know how much sound you're getting exposed to and track it along. And that's your own individual personal information to protect you. So that's another uh, trick to, to be aware of what your environment is doing to you. Um, Next question from Grace, which advice uh, could you give to musicians who suffer from focal dystonia? <laughs> okay, so I can quote my dear colleague Eckhart uh, Altenmuller. So best thing, Google Eckhart Altenmuller, uh, A-L-T-E-N-M-U-L-L-E out of Hanover, Germany, who's published pretty well everything that's credible in the field of focal dystonia. First thing to get it diagnosed, so I can do that, or your local neurologist probably cannot do that. So somebody, somebody is very familiar with motor control problems amongst musicians, and there aren't that many. Uh, so another prominent publisher researcher is Steve Frucht, uh, or F-R-U-C-H-T. Steve is in New York at Columbia. So um, if you can find these uh, uh, folks. Uh, Eckhart just published in March in our journal, MPPA, the connection between traumatic stress and uh, the outcome of focal dystonia. Brilliant uh, analysis, qualitative analysis of six case studies, looking at somewhat of a psychodynamic model 
of uh, what happened. And he's written about Schumann's miserable life with his mother and father-in-law and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so Schumann's a good case study in terms of uh, focal Estonia. But again, in the real life day-to-day -day work, that's what I do and, and shake down what exactly I talked to you about today, about trauma history and methods to mitigate, you know, uh, the autonomic or nervous system consequences of post-traumatic stress disorder and motor control. So that's basically what we do here, not only pain and mental health issues, but motor control. And uh, we uh, welcome you to uh, seek out help uh, here or with other colleagues across uh, Canada. From Jose, what kind of movement, body techniques uh, you think can be great addition to a musician's preventive health discipline? Uh, that's a planted question from my colleagues from Alexander Technique, body mapping technique, Feldenkrais. Uh, I have a grad student, Julia, at the University of Toronto looking at dyspokinesis, which is a whole other school of movement therapy I don't know anything about, but I'm willing to to uh, work with the team to try to understand how that works. Uh, <clears throat> basically, there's quite a bit of evidence to support mindfulness-based uh, interventions, which include yoga, uh, qigong, which is a healthy uh, version, martial arts uh, version of tai chi. Um, uh, there are many other uh, movement therapies uh, out there uh, and other practitioners who are promoting their version of different uh, movement exercises. So again, partly consumer beware, look at the evidence, look at the uh, affordability and, and practicality of that. But, but generally many of the pedagogues uh, that you've heard from that are coaching you have actually done training in Alexander technique and body mapping techniques. And they're all listed uh, in the PAMA membership and they're very active group uh, looking at how that all works and how what the evidence is that it does more good than harm. Uh, from Alexander, I heard from an audiologist that you can get custom fit earplugs that reduce decibels a certain amount without changing the sound. Excellent planted question. Marshall's not here. Uh, these are custom fit uh, earplugs like a hearing aid mold. Uh, it's kind of yucky to get squirted in. Uh, it eventually comes back nicely fitted because the fit is important. And in there, Marshall drills a little hole and, and puts in a tuning port. So with his magic, you can actually flatten out the attenuation curve. Now, if you don't want to get goo put in your ear, you can get uh, uh, off the shelf ER15, 15, 15 means 15 decibel attenuation or 25 if you're a rock drummer to get that much of attenuation. Uh, they may or may not fit well. They may fit uh, comfortably or uncomfortably. And those are some of the issues that uh, are difficult. Uh, again, better wear it than not wear it under high risk situations like uh, uh, 1812 or uh, the Tycho drummers at the uh, OSM, which I've heard a, a lot about. So those are some uh, ideas. Um, Obviously custom fits better uh, for if you're doing rock gigs, gigs you know, I would invest in in the ear monitors that are custom fit. We do that a lot, especially if you're going back between classical and uh, you know, popular genres. So that's worth it uh, to have it. And you know, if you go out to clubs that you really are way too old to go to John, uh, but I've been known to go to rock clubs and here's some more recent stuff I can't remember, but old stuff I do remember. Uh, the sound levels are extremely high in these uh, venues, even big stadiums. So again, always I always carry my my earplugs around in my little pack as well with my EpiPen. So uh, it's uh, very useful to have. Just when you when you need them, you should have them there. Okay. Um, I think there was another company that was uh, trying to promote other earplugs just off the internet. Again, I don't have any experience. Uh, Soundbrenner, that's, uh, I got their mic, their metronome uh, watch that tells me not to speed up when I practice, um, but also they're marketing some 
into your active monitors. I, I can't comment whether, because uh, I haven't bought them myself yet. <clears throat> Next question, interested in relation between sound emission and wood players articulation and the phonetic components of different spoken language. Do you know of any investigation or recent publication uh, uh, related to the theme or could you recommend? This is a question custom made for Marshall Chasin, C-H-A-S-I-N. So if you go to musiciansclinics.com, uh, uh, you can talk to Marshall directly with this because he also teaches phonetics at the University of Toronto and he'd be fascinated to look at the difference between uh, say uh, playing Japanese wind instruments versus you know classical European instruments and the connection to their phonetic languages and all that stuff. So he's the perfect guy for that. I'm the uh, very practical boring guy to try to fix up the injuries. So, so uh, contact Marshall with that really great question. I'll go back to the Q&A. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. Do you have any advice for musicians who are preparing for a performance and experiencing pain? When a performance is upcoming, we aren't really able to stop practicing and may not have the time for intensive therapies or treatment. Do you have any advice to manage it until we can treat it more thoroughly? Uh, that's from Avery. And it's a brilliant question. So yeah, please don't leave it too late. Wait for the Hamilton Clinic to assess you. We're working, I'm trying to whittle down our six month waiting list now. And you got to perform at the Rostropovich or the Chopin next week or in the fall or those big additions. So that's really the catch 22 of this. So uh, bottom line, listen to your body, what's happening. I think I've given you enough information to try to analyze what's happening here. You obviously building up your resilience, your tolerance, what, what variables can you do right on the spot uh, other than just quitting and, and going to a clinic? Well, you can improve your sleep, that's huge. You can take CBD, that's huge. You can just go to the dispensary or find a local cannabis clinic to get your CBD, cannabidiol. You don't need THC for that. So let's get over the Cheech and Chong, uh, stigma hysteria over uh, legal medical and recreational cannabis. Okay, so CBD is very powerful anti-inflammatory and pain control. You're not gonna hide the injury. It's still gonna break through. You're still aware of the biomechanics and the stress factor. Getting into regular meditation, okay? During the workday, taking your breaks, meditating, calming your system down getting a heart rate variability monitor, which you can get on online, get a Muse headset to look at your brain waves, get a heart math, heart rate variability monitor to see how stressed you are when you're playing and learn how to decrease your vagal tone. Remember what happens to the vagus stays in the vagus. Delete, clear your monkey mind of past traumatic experiences. Just because the last jury told you boo doesn't mean you're a boo forever, okay? That's just the opinion of that particular jury at that particular time relative to the other competitors, okay? Um, yeah, if you're recording with the Montreal Symphony with a new conductor and you're trying to prove yourself, well, you might wanna take some cognitive behavioral therapies that it's just a new conductor and this is an old piece and Berlin seems to have won all the awards and hopefully the o OSM will get some good ratings, but don't think about that stuff. You just wanna play, play the notes great, feel good, get into your own zone of optimal performance and practice that so when you actually go to the competition or the recording session, you're able to go there. That's exactly what the Olympic team is trying to do in Tokyo, but you can imagine now, they're preparing for their event. They've done, they spent their whole life preparing for this, and now they got this COVID craziness happening, you know, with the outbreaks and all the controversies you're seeing before the opening event tomorrow. The, um, so it must be really tough. So, kudos to our Olympic team overseas. But the same 
the same uh, preparation and mitigation of the stress. The Olympics will go on, whatever happens, happens. And you try to decrease your stress reactivity as you go through it. And that is a train learn response. Uh, the Olympic team does have a program uh, that has uh, uh, received accolades, international accolades in the way we prepare our Olympic athletes. The same techniques can be applied to us in your orchestra uh, or at your conservatory. Uh, so that's basically um, uh, the kind of work uh, that you can uh, bring in. If you can push uh, uh, your school to get a course going, please do, because as I've told you, it's actually policy south of the border for the NASM schools. As I understand in Canada, we don't have the similar kind of stick to say to administration, thou shalt have a prevention performance awareness class. But again, it's up to the local institution if they have the resources or the faculty willpower to bring this in. And again, kudos go to the board and Jean-Philippe and uh, Pace um, uh, for inviting me to uh, share some of these ideas. Okay, so that's a bit of a long-winded answer, uh, but definitely just don't stop. You have to find a way to quote, fake it or, or, or and make it rather than break it. So there are many tricks to, to get through this and then come and learn more about it. So from even this uh, short presentation, you can learn lots of techniques and give them a try. Um, uh, even in during your uh, uh, online master classes right now, try it one way, thinking about that, trying a different way, not thinking about that and seeing what the outcome is. Uh, Bottom line though, the boundary rules apply to your place as they do to faculty music as the GGS right across the world now, because now I can come out and be much more blunt about some of the mishaps we've had with boundary violations. It's not funny, it's long lasting, the injuries. You can look at Lara St. John's experience. You can look at, at the whole history of the OSM or the Toronto Symphony, or in fact, uh, National Arts, uh, orchestra and some of the uh, the tracks of my tears as I call them uh, even in Juilliard it just uh, hit the press as you probably uh, followed um, and it's it's not funny uh, really and people are being called called on not to do this anymore and suffering um, uh, the consequences of these uh, boundary violations both physical and psychological so I think I can come out of the closet and and say that any other last questions? There's one from Marie Sophie. Devil's claw and turmeric tinctures help a lot to decrease inflammation in the body. Yes, they do. So there's lots of homeopathic as well as dietary um, issues you can look at in terms of living an anti inflammatory lifestyle. I've tried this myself. Uh, I unfortunately don't drink any more wine or beer with alcohol in it. I still drink the same volume of wine and beer, except that it doesn't have alcohol because alcohol tends to inflame the body. And combined with CBD and having a nice curry dinner and uh, having my uh, vitamins every morning, uh, things seem to be working okay. I can play Brahms 34 on Saturday and play 18 holes yesterday, win 10 bucks, we'll see tomorrow. No guarantees, but you know, it does decrease the wear and tear and the inflammatory response. The less inflammatory material you take into your body and your diet, the less likely you're gonna react in an inflammatory way when your body and mind is challenged by stress. So that's, uh, sort of common sense, but in my case, it's uh, helped increase my uh, Brahms career as well as my sad golfing career. Uh, that applies to your day job as well. Me as a doctor, because burnout is very high, it's very challenging work. So obviously as uh, budding professional musicians, practicing a lot, performing under stress, but also you know, building your teaching practice and your accolades, it's a long journey. So the more you adopt an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, which includes diet, which includes exercise, and all these cognitive and emotional strategies, the better. So that's um, 
a really, really important question. Anything else? Uh, I don't see anything else in the chat line and in the question and answer. Last takers, hopefully I've answered them as best I can. Let me X out of here and make sure I haven't missed any. I don't see anything. Good. We still have about 10 minutes to go. Oh, here comes enough. Aha, you've read Harvey Pennock's book. Very funny pace. I've actually visited Harvey at, in Austin. I've also visited Stevie Ray Vaughan in Austin. So if those of you don't, don't know who Harvey Pennock is, it's Take Dead Aim. It's a little red book for golfers. And uh, it really does actually highlight, it's a classic. You might wanna look at some of the sports medicine classics, but that's, you know, what the Olympic athletes are doing. You take a look at that target, whether you're gonna jump uh, uh, or do whatever event you're doing and they just focus on one, one thing. So in the world of golf, you've seen it all. And you know, there's big money in golf now. So the better you are, like Morakama was uh, last Sunday, going down the back nine, bang, 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 bang. There was nothing else going on in his mind. He wasn't mad, he wasn't determined, he wasn't fearful. Uh, nothing. He was just in the zone, executing exactly. So the whole pedagogy of sports uh, psychology is now very interesting uh, that we can apply very directly uh, to our craft and music. PAMA, Performing Arts Medicine Association, has a collaboration with the American College of Sports Medicine called Athletes and the Arts. Uh, Interesting. So obviously playing football is not quite the same as playing trombone, even though I know various trombone players that have had a football career. Um, but the same principles do apply. Uh, or in your case, Pace, playing high C on a trumpet. Well, before you hit that at the Sky Dome, in, uh, uh, when the uh, chariots came out or the monsters came out um, in Aida, uh, that we could practice that now. So I've learned much from the good old days uh, when we uh, uh, dealt with your particular situation. You know, I, I wish we could visualize that. Why are you up and somehow make that high C without uh, having injury? So we do not have the capability of the ape lab to, to look at some of these factors and prepare yourself to get there with the least amount of wear and tear. Nobody's going to say that playing a high C uh, uh, in this you know, challenging situation is, is not dangerous. Okay, so we're not trying to wipe out all danger in the, in the activity, but how do we get there in a safe way uh, to uh, minimize the risk of injury and, and damage to your human body? So that's a brilliant uh, question. Uh, uh, going back uh, in history. So the same questions apply. We can uh, beg, borrow and steal a bit from sports medicine. Uh, much is being done in this area using much of these uh, techniques, biofeedback techniques in golf, of course, but in many, many sports now. And now we're starting to use them in dance and acting, and of course, in music and voice. So. Uh, many more years of uh, uh, great uh, collaborative work to be done uh, through PAMA and, and many other brilliant young investigators that are, are coming up in the field. So I would encourage you to um, explore the PAMA uh, uh, information that's out there, get involved with your local conservatory, your pedagogues, your favorite teachers, maybe unfavorite teachers, start talking about this. That's how we uh, increase the awareness by conversations, decreasing stigma, opening up uh, lines of communication, and uh, learning about this uh, whole brand new uh, field of performing arts medicine. So great. Anything else? Um, try to get off my soapbox too much. Sound a bit like a politician here, but uh, it's a very important uh, topic. Uh, in summary, in my career, I've seen lots and lots of cases, all these injuries, and they're real life. They're not just statistics. And working with you has been a privilege. 
whether you're a student level and you're in or at the end of your career uh, battling these issues uh, and trying to make the best of it and adjusting your career to find a way to just enjoy your playing not uh, uh, being overcome by the stress response has been you know very much a challenge but very rewarding to work with with everybody in the arts community so we have much more work to do you can see some of the institutional barriers that we have both in pedagogy and uh, education but also very much in the industry which is right now we're actually starting to break through uh, we had a couple of great webinars of what it's like on Broadway. Some of these issues have become quite public and, and, and people are talking about it. And of course, now with the COVID reopening, it's going to be a real challenge, uh, not just the, the stuff that I talk about, but the health and safety issues about safe distancing, masking, uh, vaccinations, uh, etc. in terms of uh, safely returning to work in the next hopefully year. Uh, once the COVID rates uh, die down, hopefully. Uh, but you're, you guys are all <clears throat> tuned in on a day-by-day -day basis about that. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully next year we can meet face-to-face uh, -face and do some of these things uh, uh, more intimately and actually have some case examples and see muscles jumping and your heart rate variability changing and stuff like that. But again, that's the best uh, we can do virtually. So hopefully, you know, some of these concepts are there. If you want further information, just email me. I can send you my book chapter or you can get into the PAMA website, which has just been rebuilt. So be patient with it. But uh, a lot of resources are going to be available. If you want to pursue this professionally, uh, and many of uh, artists have, are doing this as part of their DMA and doing research and studying this, there are many... Uh, many more institutions that are, uh, are willing to accept you. London has a master's program. We, we have a PhD program in Toronto. There are programs in uh, Texas uh, and Johns Hopkins now that are opening up so that you can maintain your performing career, your artist career, but also add in the performing arts medicine component. There is a essentials course that PAMA offers that uh, we put it online. Uh, few hundred bucks, which is now tailored to not just the medical healthcare professionals, uh, but also the educators and performers. So we're, that is just coming off the line now. And it's been quite successful to learn in deeper ways, more of the, the uh, science and, and what to do about it. So again, more knowledge is not a dangerous thing. It's to combat the fake news out there and some of the fears about some of the conditions I've talked about uh, today. So hopefully you're feeling comfortable about this. If you're feeling dysregulated, go for a walk. Try to keep your alcohol intake at the pub down today. But uh, having a beer after a long, boring lecture like this is not a bad idea. It's just the amount of alcohol that's toxic. Okay, so uh, anything else? We're pretty well, uh, got five minutes. Uh, time is ticking as I can see on my screen. I um, uh, just want to thank uh, uh, all the organizers, specifically Pace, uh, uh, Sylvie, Jose, Luca, for organizing the webinar. Best wishes to you all wherever you are. Safe playing and of course, uh, please be safe of COVID. I'll throw in my two bits about your vaccinations. Get vaccinated. Um, on that note, I'm getting calls because now uh, things are starting to open up. Musicians are being hired again. Employers are not exempt for demanding double vaccinations. So in spite of all the anti-vax fake news out there, uh, that's your best protection from getting COVID uh, and wave four during the fall when things are gonna be indoors, uh, unless you wanna play uh, Valero outside in the snowbank it's not going to work. Okay, so we're going to be indoors, we're going to be in the conservatory, we're going to be back at the conservatory. The problem is, you need to be vaccinated to protect yourself from this Delta variant. And unfortunately, this bug is uh, very smart, as Fau Tony Fauci would say, and keeps mutating and keeps getting variants. And that's going to become from unvaccinated populations. 
half of the states, if you're in the states uh, who vote a certain way, are going to be unvaccinated. Nowhere near 80% required for herd immunity and protection for the rates for the virus to die down. Canada, we might actually get there. We're at about 50, 60% and depending on where you are in the country. So we're doing way better. We're actually leading the world now in vac double vaccination rates. And uh, so kudos to our public health crowd who are my professional colleagues, great job. But again, I gotta uh, reach out to this population, say please um, you know, do your own self um, protection as well as protecting your colleagues you know, when, when we go live again in the fall, which we probably will. And uh, if you look at the British rates, it's not a pretty picture. Saturday, we had 50,000 new cases thanks to the soccer. So we all went to the pubs. I had my fake pub at home and watched you know, Italy win and to the chagrin of the England crowd. We had 400,000 at British Grand Prix on the weekend. We had 32,000 a day at the British Open. And now we also have 50,000 fresh cases of COVID. So needless, need do I say more in the States, in Florida, Arizona, and Texas, the Delta variants uh, have tripled literally in the last couple of weeks. So that's today's rates from John Hopkins, not a pretty picture. Ontario, uh, where I am so far so good, we've got pretty good vaccination around the GTA. Montreal, I think is uh, doing quite well uh, as well. Uh, again, the problem is, is because of the mix-ups in the vaccines, AstraZeneca and Pfizer, blah, blah, blah. So. Uh, these are all the micro details of managing the COVID uh, pandemic and what lies ahead. So again, in summary, you know, please protect yourself, be aware uh, of the dangers, especially in choir situations and woodwind situations in closed poor ventilation environments. They are indeed high risk situations of transmitting the aerosol. We have a couple webinars on our website that you can access to really detail some of what I've just alluded to. Fascinating engineering, but again, from a public health situation, you wanna prevent getting a very tragic situation of getting the cytokine storm and then you know ending up in ICU and not making it. So the cases are still out there um, and coming in in the unvaccinated uh, population at the current time. So that's how I can distill that information uh, for you on a platter. Okay. Well, I on on that exactly. note, uh, I would like um, to thank you really much, uh, Dr. Chong. It's always uh, very interesting and very pertinent and all kinds of great tools that the students can apply in their daily lives as musicians. And it's really, uh, it's really wonderful to have you again. Thank you I very appreciate, much. appreciate the opportunity to the whole gang, especially you, Sylvie. And so any, anytime you want follow up uh, for information or clinical help, you know, please contact the clinic. The information is available through administration or the, the um, uh, taping of uh, this uh, webinar. So thanks very much for the opportunity to share this and please be safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.